Hello one and all and welcome to Behind the Glass, the podcast which aims to take you behind the scenes of the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass as well as the automotive and social media worlds. Well, this is episode three of season two of Behind the Glass and this episode is going to be slightly different to those that have come before it because in recent weeks, Vicky, my girlfriend and I have been sharing stories from the road, a sort of alternative behind the scenes look at Drive the World, my 12 month round the world trip. But the last week we haven't really been on the road we've been based here in Bulgaria you find me right now in Vicky's house in Bulgaria and so there's not enough sort of to tell or enough to talk about for an entire podcast so instead I want to share my sort of failed main channel video at Rimac, the electric hypercar manufacturer. If you missed the previous episode where I talked about this video, effectively it was a sort of uh, factory tour gone wrong. Uh, I was supposed to be filming a main channel video, as I just mentioned, but I just didn't quite work out. I drank the Rimac Kool-Aid, uh, got caught up in all of Matte Rimac's stories, which are fascinating, and then ended up making a 35 minute video, which I didn't think was uh, entertaining or engaging enough for Seen Through Glass, but I wanted to share it somehow because it is really interesting, as I mentioned. Now, word of warning for those of you who are purely listening to Behind the Glass, the audio quality isn't that good. Because I was filming it for what I thought would be a main Seen Through Glass video, I didn't have it all sort of mic'd up properly, but I do still think it is easy to hear what Mate is talking about. If you want, I think, maybe a slightly better experience, I would argue that you should head over to the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash behind the glass, and watch this podcast. Those of you already watching on YouTube, hello, I think you've made the better decision. Uh, hilariously, Shmi150 uh, did a very similar video or, or chat with Matteo Rimac a few weeks after me and of course as is always the way with Shmi he beat me to the upload so some of you may have already seen this kind of uh, video that I heard this story from Mate before but maybe there are some of you out there who haven't so not sure there's much more else for me to say apart from to roll the clip the introduction itself is the sort of the most echoey and the worst for audio it does improve I promise I hope you enjoy Well, I have been joined by the main man himself, Mr. Rimac. Matteo, thank you very much for, uh, for welcoming me here of course, at your thanks for coming. showroom. No, not at all. I, I feel like you're a bit of a sort of celebrity within the car social media scene. You've appeared on umpteen YouTube channels, but you are now on Seen Through Glass, so thank I you. I hope it's more about our cars, not about myself. Yeah, it is, it is. And one thing I want to kick, how I want to kick off this video is by explaining to my audience that might not know is that Rimac is so much more than the company that built the Concept 1 and are now building the Concept 2. You do so much more than that, right? Yeah, it's, it came in this way through the evolution of the company. Um, at the beginning, I wanted to show that the invention of Nikola Tesla, who is from Croatia, the electric machine that we are using today in so many applications, is actually great for not just making, you know, boring, dull electric cars, what was the image 10 years ago, you know, like G-Wiz and stuff like that. G-Wiz uh, is just awful. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to show that electric cars, like, I was wondering, why is nobody using the advantages of this perfect machine to make a car that's fun and exciting and fast? And I built an, a 1984 uh, E30 BMW into an electric car to compete against gas-powered cars. After some time, the car really became good, like, I proved it after every race when things would, you know, fall apart and you know but I just kept coming back to the races with a better and better car and in 2011 I broke 5 FIA in and the Guinness World Records with that car wow. for the fastest accelerating electric cars which funnily enough this old BMW still holds today okay I love it <laughs> and you know I was inspired by Horatio Pagan and uh, Christian von Königsegg I knew that it's really really difficult to build a car and that hundreds of people have tried and failed but these two guys actually made it and they are very like unique one of the you know, they're the only guys who have actually done it in the last decades. For sure, for sure. They're literally leading the way in terms of that, yeah, independent hypercar manufacturer. Exactly. And I wanted to do what they have done, but not just make an electric car, but use the potential of electric powertrains to make the car better. But we started 10 years ago. I was like 21, 20, 20, <laughs> okay, 20 years you old. You look about 23 now, so you're doing <laughs> I'm 21 well, yeah. now. Um, and it was really difficult to get started, especially because Croatia is the country probably in, in Europe that has least car industry, almost nothing. 
Um, so there was no know-how, there was no venture capital funds, it was really difficult to get to investors. And in order to survive and to build a company, we had started to work for other car companies to finance the development of our own car. And then I realized people don't want to invest in a supercar company. <laughs> they seem like they think it's totally crazy. Sure. But in a company that develops technologies for other car manufacturers, they want to invest in it. And that's, by the way, I'm never dressed like this. Today I'm signing uh, the deal with uh, Hyundai and Kia. They are invest So last year we had Porsche investing in a company, which was a big deal for us. And today the vice chairman of Hyundai is coming, which is, by the way, a company that has four times more revenues than Croatia's total GDP. What? Yeah. Yeah, that's outrageous. <laughs> so he's coming here today. I'm signing this big deal with him. That's wow. why I'm dressed like this. I'm usually never like that. No, no. Hey, look. Congratulations. <laughs> and if there's ever a time to put on a suit, that is the time. Yeah, I have to. <laughs> yeah. so, so is that the focus now? I mean, is your dream still to be the electric Pagani in Koenigsegg? Or have actually your priorities shifted as time's gone on and now you get enjoyment out of making components for these other manufacturers? Well, uh, the much bigger part of our business is the component business where we develop and make uh, components like battery packs and syst- powertrain systems and stuff like that for other car companies. And that's why all of these car companies are investing in us. Um, and the two businesses are actually working incredibly well together. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense to develop, it would be impossible to develop all of these things specifically for this car for the low volume um, production uh, that we are doing for the C2 if we wouldn't be using these components somewhere else as well. It wouldn't make no sense. It wouldn't make no sense to have 300 engineers working on this car because small companies, uh, other small hypercar manufacturers have much smaller teams because they cannot afford to have such large teams and such large development effort. You can only do that because we sell these things to other car manufacturers. Then, you know, you could ask yourself, why would, do you even need the car? You can just make one and showcase your stuff. But I'm always saying, like, if the shareholders one day decide that this doesn't make any more sense, they have to look for another CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's like go. that's keeping the CEO happy. That's exactly keeping the CEO happy. <laughs> well, look, I think uh, enough intro chat. Let's head into uh, the fact. Do you call it a factory or do you call it a what, what do you call this place? HQ. Yeah, our HQ. Everything. Okay. Well, it's it's a strange place because we started here with in this location in 2012 with 12 people. 12. People. Now How we're many? Over 500. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's a mess actually. Pro- space is our number one problem, okay. and we are having several locations to cope with that, building a new campus and stuff like yeah. that. But every, a lot of it is happening here, and I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, let's go have a look. Let's see. So, our engineering is divided in two areas. This is vehicle engineering and upstairs, and in other locations we have component engineering. In vehicle engineering we are developing the whole car, but not the parts that we also sell to others. So, for example, um, everything which is just related to the car, like the uh, carbon fiber monocoque, the suspension, the aerodynamics, the cooling system, the interior, and so on, is developed here. But for example, we have a power t- uh, powertrain integration team here that's integrating the powertrain, but they are not developing the motors and gearboxes. That's developed by our components department upstairs because that's the stuff that we sell also to other car companies. Uh, so basically the whole car is developed here, uh, or the majority of the car. Um, and these guys are still working very much on the C2. So just to show you how uh, it's distributed, so we have a vehicle dynamics team. So they are developing the suspension, the kinematics, the braking system, um, all of the simulations for performance, like they are simulating, you know, Nürburgring lap times all the time, accelerations. <laughs> Two minutes, speed. 15 seconds, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite, but yeah. Then we have Trims, uh, which is making the interior and the crash uh, structure, the crash simulations for the interior. And we have Body, which is developing the carbon fiber monocoque, which we will see later. Um, we have CFD, so we have supercomputers outside here uh, in containers doing the aerodynamic and crash test simulations all the time. So we have a team here, powertrain, electronics, and project management. So there's 70 engineers here, plus the design team upstairs, uh, plus the components engineering. So we have uh, in the company almost 300 engineers, and almost all of them are working on the car. And which is very unique is in this place, almost the whole car is developed in one company. So we have a very very, very high vertical integration. Everything developed here and most of the stuff made here. So that's why this place is quite interesting. Okay, and can I also ask, because my experience in factories and development is limited, Everyone's on a computer, so there's no one here tapping suspension arms or with a screwdriver. Is that normal or are you very special in the way that you develop just using computers at this stage? Well, we of course do lots of physical things as well right next door, I'll show you that. But uh, the point of development in a virtual environment is that you can do much more and much faster. So for example, you can test a million different suspension setups because by just changing four uh, things in the suspension, you can have a million 
combinations and there's a lot of more things you can change in the suspension like the geometry, the pickup points, the stiffness, the, uh, the compliance of the components and so on. Everything starts with modeling and the more modeling you do the better you can test the car before you build it first. So when you build it first you should be actually very similar. So one of the things we do, so for everything in the car there is a model. So you start with the tire model, so you have a mathematical equation that represents the tire. You have a model for the battery, for the aerodynamics, for the suspension, and you find the whole car during that cycle and bring the models to a more mature level. And one of the things you do, you can plug that model into a simulator, which is a dynamic simulator, so you're moving around, and you can drive the car a year before there is a car. And sometimes you feel stuff there, like for example, what you can feel in the simulator, we have four motors, right? So we have front wheel drive as well. So when you go in a corner and the torque vectoring distributes the torque between the left and the right wheel on the front, you might have torque steer. And you can feel that in the simulator before you make the car. So for example, you have to change the suspension pickup points, which means you have to change the monocoque. And if the monocoque was already produced and you had the molds for it, it would cost millions to do that change. While you are in the simulator and in the simulation phase, you can do that without any cost, basically. We came to this location when we were 12 people. Now we are over 500 people in the same location, so we have a huge space issue. The space is actually the number one problem of the company. And we are building a new campus where the whole company will move. It's a beautiful, incredible location that we will build. One day you'll see that yeah. next time you come here. Uh, but we have to survive in the meantime. So we were building floors and stuff. This floor didn't exist the, you know, one year ago and stuff like that. So it's very cramped, but uh, the great thing is a lot of things are happening and you can learn. Like if you're a chassis guy, you can learn about batteries. If you're a motor guy, you can learn about electronics. You know, that's nice. Cool. Amazing. Let me show you how yeah, these please, things please, look yeah, like. Yeah, absolutely. So we have all the vehicle models running here at the same time and we are simulating a track here. And this is not just a nice uh, video that looks like a, a video game, but it's actually a lot of uh, simulation behind it and lots of data behind it, like the model of the suspension, of the track, of the tires, of the powertrain and so on. Um, and what we are doing here, for example, is we have software in the loop. So we are simulating the torque vectoring behavior in this case and looking at what the torque vectoring will do in different simulations, in different situations. Um, and for the algorithm, it feels exactly as if it was in the car. Um, so we are simulating to the software, to the piece of software, to torque vectoring, all the inputs like the steering angle, the brake pedal position, the, steer the throttle pedal position, the forces of the car, the gyroscope um, data. So it would react exactly in the same way like in the car. So we can simulate things that you cannot really do with a normal car here or in reality and to figure out the extremes but also uh, to tune the system a thousand times before we actually put it on the road for the first time. Uh, to be safe, but also to have the best performance already. Um, of course, you will do a lot of tuning in the reality based on the driver feeling. You cannot do everything in simulations, but this gets you already pretty close. And you can do the rough things here that would be very difficult to do in a real car, because here you can do lots of changes, while in the real car you can only tune small things. From the first surfaces that we had uh, from the design team, we changed every surface a million times. So when you see the final production car, it might look the same like the first car you saw, but actually everything was changed. And it's quite easy to make a beautiful car, but a car that fulfills all the requirements, like crash testing, uh, homologation requirements, like where the positions of the light are, the U angles, cooling requirements, efficiency, all of that, that's a lot of work. Okay. So to make a car that looks good and has all the functions and combines it in a good package, that's difficult. And we have really worked a lot to achieve that, so every piece on this car, every little thing has its purpose and it has been optimized a thousand times. So David here is fighting with our design team, with the production <laughs> team, with everybody uh, to make the best compromise. People that say, you know, we are making no compromise, they are just lying. Okay, uh, okay, you are trying to find, I mean, and, but where do you start? Do you start saying, I want to make the most aerodynamically functional car? Or for you, is it important that it's beautiful? Well, it depends which kind of car you make. So for example, an Aston Martin Valkyrie, for which we designed the battery, so we know it quite well. That's a very extreme car, so there, it's absolutely about aerodynamics only. And then they don't really care how difficult it is to get in and out the car. In our case, we had different requirements, like for example, um, range, because it's an electric car, so it has to be efficient. Uh, cooling, uh, it has lots of systems inside, so we needed a lot of cooling. Um, we wanted to make it easy to enter into the car and get out. We wanted it to be comfortable. So you have to combine all of these aspects 
and make targets for every system. So for example, at the beginning we already had uh, the target how much air we need to get into the front of the car to cool the battery in the front powertrain. But actually we have, so we have four motors and the rear axle powertrain is separated from the front axle powertrain. So in the rear we have separated inverter motor gearbox and the rear carries more than 70% of the load but the front is in the airflow. So the problem is how do you get more air into the rear cooling system than into the front cooling system? So it already starts with the front actually. You don't start with the rear. So we are directing the air under the car, over the car, through the car and through the side of the car to get the air inside the rear system. So for every of these aspects we had targets from the beginning and you cannot say if aerodynamics was a priority over powertrain, everything is a priority. You, know? okay. you just have to okay. know at the beginning what kind of car you want to make. Sure. So he had basically the same targets from day one. So one of the things we wanted to achieve is to have a certain downforce, uh, but at the same time have low drag. So we have 0.28, right, in low drag mode. And we confirmed that actually all the simulations confirmed, like I think in some cases 98% overlapping with the real test with the one-to-one -one, uh, mm -hmm. model in the, in the wind tunnel. So, uh, and that's the one that's in the lobby at the moment, the visitor center lobby? Exactly, yeah. that's, okay. that's in the lobby, yeah. Super cool. Yeah. And you, you know, here, uh, so this is not the real car, that's like a, a mock-up. Sure. And uh, why that is, so for example, he had several um, options of components like the spoiler or the wings or the air intakes. And we, had, we came there to the wind tunnel with several of these and you could interchange them and correlate with the models. Uh, and it's much easier to do these changes when the car is in a state like this. Okay. Uh, so every stage of the project has a certain cost for changes or time to change. Sure. So this is just models. Here you already have a mock-up. And then after that you have the real car. So here you make the really like 95% of the work. Here you do the remaining or 10% or whatever, yeah, and, and then, then with the real car... You don't want to change anything, right? You don't really want to change anything anymore. <laughs> okay, okay. But we have confirmed our models here already, so with the real car it's going to be just slight differences because like uh, differences in body gap panels and stuff like that, but that's already sure, pretty much it. Sure. Okay, so one of the very important things is of course uh, safety and homologation. So we are going through a full crash testing program with the C2, not like for a small volume homologation car, but like all the tests which means we will crash a lot of cars and of course when we start crashing then we want to make sure that we are already quite good. So for that we are again using supercomputers to run simulations and it's quite difficult to simulate carbon fiber. So uh, we have a carbon fiber monocoque and uh, we have aluminum crash structures in the front and in the rear to absorb the, the crashes. So if you can just show the structures. So um, everything is modeled here. So for example we have six million elements, Gustavo just said, six million uh, little elements that we have to run through the simulations to see this and this is also like a nice video now but this has been like we have done we have worked on this for years and went through hundreds of iterations to make this really work and for example the carbon fiber monocoque on its own just the top without the roof has 2200 carbon fiber plies and a small number of units am yeah. I correct in saying that you don't always have to comply with the full range of crash testing that maybe yeah. Mercedes or, or uh, Renault would have to. Why are you choosing to go so far with the C2? Our main job is developing components and systems for big car companies. And usually we always work for cars that are produced on a high volume. So with the C2 we want to show what we know as a company. And we are going really the extra mile on top of what we would need to do. But also we want to make cars that are really safe. We want to be sure that they are safe. So that's why we are going through the whole testing program. And we are selling them globally. So we are doing EU and US homologation for all the crash tests. And we are doing that not with one or two cars, but we are building like almost 30 cars, which mostly will be crashed. Some of them will be used for hot uh, weather climate testing. Some of them will be used for cold weather, weather climate testing. So that's really the way how big car companies are doing it. Because uh, also the C2 is quite special because it has been developed absolutely from ground up from a white sheet of paper which is very rare in industry because usually the car companies always start from something from the platform, the power chain and so on in this case everything from scratch and we are doing this big testing program to make sure that everything is done right plus not just from scratch, it's a lot of innovation so uh, 1.4 megawatt uh, electric powertrain, 120 kilowatt hour battery pack uh, carbon fiber monocoque with integrated battery these are many things that people have never done before. 
So that's why we are really going the extra mile to make sure everything's done right. So from computer cars, I'm now seeing physical cars. Yeah. I guess this is an assembly or workshop? What's going on so here? So this is where all the components come together. So we are producing the components all over the company, which you'll see. And then here they are assembled in the nest ways, which means the chassis comes to one point and the components are assembled to it. The C2 will be produced in an assembly line. So now it's a very special moment uh, in our history. So we have the last three Concept 1 cars being assembled here. And right behind them, you can see three uh, C2 prototypes being assembled. And that's actually interesting to see the difference because the Concept 1 was a chrome moly uh, welded structure. And we did that a lot of time ago. We presented the car in 2011 in Frankfurt when we were like eight guys in the company. Yeah. Had no okay. idea what we were doing, sure. no money, no experience. Um, so of course we improved a lot with the C2. Gotcha. I mean the Concept 1 was signif I mean, a significant car uh, in terms of you know, being the first uh, real electric hypercar and so on. But the C2 is on a completely different level, it's on like, light years away. And you can see the difference. So the last three um, Concept 1s and let's have a look at how the C2 monocoque looks like. Please. So we see here the C2 prototypes in production. We are actually building somewhere around 30 currently. This is the monocoque which is quite a special thing. So it's designed, as you've seen in the simulations, for global homologation. And there are a few things that are interesting about it. So for example, it's the biggest common fiber piece in the industry. So the front and the rear suspension are actually on the same piece. Okay. It's not a subframe, it doesn't have a rear subframe. The battery pack is a structural component integrated into the monocoque. And the battery modules inside are structural, and even the cells are stress members. So we have an incredibly high uh, structural rigidity. We have 80,000 newton meters per degree, which is by far, as far as I'm aware, the highest um, uh, torsional stiffness of any car. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite complex. It's like beyond Formula One okay. to produce it. <laughs> sure, that's totally natural, just beyond Formula One. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, and just to sort of prove to some of my audience that maybe have seen a carbon tub, I guess from my guys it'd be McLaren, which sometimes they have their sort of mono cell structure, which is just that main tub. They don't have any yeah, of so this, right? Most of the monocoques they end like here in the front, and in the rear they are ending here, and then like the Aventador has a steel subframe, the uh, let's say Pagani has an aluminum subframe, or. Um, the Bugatti Chiron has a carbon fiber rear subframe. Here it's one piece and the rear suspension is actually on the same piece. Wow. And then it has a huge hole from underneath where the battery pack comes in. And the battery pack then gives it the structure it needs for the, um, for the front bottom. And we have the rear powertrain and the front powertrain also integrated into the monocoque. So everything is inside. The only parts that are not inside the monocoque is the rear crash structures which come here. They're actually quite short and the front crash structures. So the monocoque shouldn't be damaged in any of the crashes. So if you have, let's say, a normal crash, if there's <laughs> sure, such a thing. Yeah, it's such a thing. Um, but uh, the only crash where the car, where the monocoque is actually damaged is in the side impact. Okay. And even there we have lots of, um, well, in the side pole impact. In, with the, when the pole comes into, like they are aiming at the head of the dummy. Okay. So that's, it comes here. And there's lots of structure in the door to absorb the energy, but it still goes into the monocoque. And then, for example, we have lots of structures inside the monocoque to catch this impact. And the interesting thing also to see is uh, of the, the package. So we didn't want to have the batteries in the floor because that raises the seat, which raises the H point, which raises the roof. <laughs> and then it's not really, it doesn't look like a hypercar anymore and you don't have the aerodynamics of a hypercar. So we don't have a battery under the floor, under the seat, but we do have uh, here in front of the seat. So where it goes up there. Ah, so your, your feet are a, a tiny bit elevated in a seating position? Exactly. Okay, so and that is like a Formula One car. <laughs> yes, but we try to make it a nice balance there. So there is this uh, H to heel point. Um, so you don't want your heel point, this point, to be too high up in, uh, with regards to your H point, which okay. is here. Okay. So we did mock-ups and simulations to make sure it isn't, so it's, it's okay here. Um, but with this, this we have achieved that the seat is low and we have a good weight distribution with batteries in the front. We have the battery in the tunnel, uh, which is very well protected. So even if you have a side crash, you don't, uh, you don't have an impact in the battery. And then a big chunk of the battery is in the rear. So it's quite a complex shape, but this is again like the result of a million of simulations. Sure. So we started like uh, with uh, lots of options. And in the end, this turned out to be the best in simulations. For example, we moved part of the battery to the front with this part under the feet, 
because we needed more traction in the front tires to use the full potential of the powertrain okay. so that we bring all the power down. Yeah. So that's all result of simulations. And one of the other things we wanted to achieve is to get to have a very easy entrance um, and exit of the car. So the monocoque is actually, like if you would have the wheel here, you would understand how far the monocoque goes inwards. Because this is where the wheel comes in the door, so you have a huge chunk of the monocoque missing here. And you have a huge chunk of the monocoque missing here because the roof opens up with the door as well. Which is difficult to, um, in terms of structure, to still have the structure there for the crashes. So there's lots of things in the bottom of the monocoque to make this work. And why we did this is we wanted to have a usable car, so not a very extreme car like, for example, the Volkerio or many other supercars where you have to first sit on the sill to get in or out. Sure. So that's why the monocoque goes inside. So when you are sitting in the seat, you can actually put your foot down. Sounds like a simple thing, but actually lots of engineering and work has to go into this thing to make this work. I can imagine. And these three beautiful structures are all for crash testing? Actually, just this one will be crashed okay. out of these three. Uh, these other two will be for vehicle dynamics and powertrain testing, but there is lots of other cars that will be tested. Mm -hmm. sure. So these, these two beauties might survive. Might survive. <laughs> this one, unfortunately, might be sacrificed. But yeah, yeah but unbelievable to see, though. You, you can, I mean, someone as inept as me can still get an idea and, and see how much engineering has gone into just creating this, let alone everything that's then going to be bolted onto it. And the interesting thing, this looks like one piece now, but actually it's 2,200 carbon fiber pieces, 222 aluminum inserts, so, for example, yeah, currently, so you cannot screw things to carbon. You cannot make a hole in carbon and screw it there. It would, you know, pull out. So you have these aluminum inserts to hold uh, things in place, uh, to mount, like, suspension parts in this case, or uh, whatever, like, some uh, aerodynamic parts and so on. Uh, so these are currently aluminum, and we are considering to move to 3D printed titanium. And this would make the car lighter, but also much more expensive. Okay. So these are the kind of trade-offs we are currently trying to figure out what to do in order to um, even improve the car. So now there is a status of the car, but we are still working. Still to trying to find ways to improve it. Yeah. Wow, amazing. Too cool. Well, thank you very much. Well, there we have it. I think a fascinating chat from Matto Remak about how they're going around building their Concept2 hypercar and everything else they do at that company. If you've enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe on whatever audio platform you're listening. And if you're watching us here on the YouTube channel, subscribe, turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes.